a lot of innovations came up when the government was grappling with um, the short supply of uh, ventilators and beds and masks. We, we, we saw a lot of youth swing into place to actually uh, go into this space. So we are talking about agile, agility, and innovation. And what this does, it actually fights poverty. Because the more they earn, the more income they get, the more they save, the more they invest, then that translates into, into investments, into healthier families, and helps to fight uh, poverty. Goal number one of sustainable development goals. What that, that does, it actually removes that youth from the street. And therefore, we see a reduction in crime and insecurity. And when you empower the youth, the economy is vibrant. You enjoy a peaceful and stable nation. People are happier. And of course, our future generation is secured. So, before I invite Chris to come in and just expound on the other things that Safaricom is doing in terms of the youth, I would like to say that investing more in economic empowerment is the right thing to do. And if we want to empower the, the young people and build stronger nations, then we must empower the youth. And that's the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tavi, for that. Um, that was rather extensive. Uh, so should we, I think, okay, we can hand it over to Chris now and then we're gonna have the Q&A session after he's done, all right? Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Chris. And I'm assuming you can also see my screen. Yes, we can see you clearly. All right. So thank you so much for inviting us and for having us today. Um, my name is Chris Otundo, and I look after recruitment at Safaricom. I am also a father of a one, 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 one son and a husband. I also um, am very passionate about people and generally just providing guidance and help where I can, especially with regards to careers. And so my colleague Tabi has talked to you about how Safaricom is, is su su supporting this agenda around inclusion and diversity. And so I thought to myself, um, how, how, how best to help the, the people on the call that we're talking to today um, in the time that we have to try and help you increase your chances of uh, being hired out there, increase your chances of being included in these different organizations that you'll be looking to work for. And even as you are um, exploring your career, what are some of the things that you should put in, put in place or think about? So this is what I'm hoping that I can talk to you about today. And I hope um, it's, it's beneficial. So what I'm titling the conversation today is Stand Out, Be Hired. So um, I like to say that there are five things that um, you need to think about when you're exploring your career. So we don't have that much time, so I'll quickly just gloss over some of those things. But I hope that you can take some time to reflect on those things I'm going to share with you today. Um, basically, before you even embark on looking for a job, before you embark on, 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 on writing your CV or going for an interview, it's important for you to reflect by yourself at home during your free time and just reflect on these five things because I believe these five things, if they all align, you will end up having a career that is fulfilling. So I'm just gonna show them to you really quickly. What you need to be thinking about before you even think about applying for a job, before you even think about um, um, inter going for an interview, is what is your personality? And I, and, I, and I enumerate there that your personality is your the patterns of your thoughts, the feelings, your behaviors. What have you over the years found out is your personality type? And there's so many ways online today. There's so many free, free platforms where you can quickly go and do. Uh, Hi, Joe. 
um, I might change the music thing. So someone might need to go on mute. Um, but basically, uh, your personality is how you sh how you show up. What are some of the the patterns that you you consistently keep going back to in terms of your thought process, the way you respond to to certain um, certain things? That is your personality. And and like I said, it's it's important for you to find time to get to know your personality, get to know yourself a little bit more. Because once you get to know your personality, there's certain there's certain jobs that you you will find yourself enjoying more. So personality is one of them. The second thing that you need to look at is your skills. What is a skill? A skill, I like to say, is something that you are trained or that you, you find that because you have gone to school, because you have attended a class, you picked up on certain, certain knowledge. And that knowledge is what you will then utilize at the workplace. What you also find at the workplace is that if you sit down with me for a whole week and see what I'm doing and actually work side by side with me, then you will get the skill of what it is that I do. You will pick up on, 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 on the, on the on the on the traits or rather the, the 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 tenets of my job so finding yourself finding finding out and and learning what skills um, are critical for the different careers that you be keen on going into this is going to be very important what skill is actually required what do i need to do do i need to go to school do i need to actually pick up an online learning the skill is going to be very critical the third area is your abilities now, abilities are something I call your innate giftings, your innate abilities. These are things that you're born with. Uh, people call them talents or your special giftings. These are things that you find yourself naturally doing. You didn't go to any particular class. You didn't need to sit side by side with Chris to learn how to do what he does. It's just something that comes naturally to you. So you've probably been around people who you, you, you wonder, how did you, how did you learn how to speak so confidently in front of a crowd? How, did, how are you able to just easily dance or how are you able to easily sing no one trained you on how to do that that is your natural gifting and it's an ability that if you are familiar with what your natural giftings are then and align that to a career that you choose chances of success are going to be very high the fourth thing is your interests a lot of times we never talk about this but it's a very in, um, important area you've heard of people who went to school for the for for four years in university and when they finished their degree in engineering, you find out a few years later that they are now um, opened a, a fashion boutique or that they're now doing tattooing or that they are now um, doing something in, 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 in the NGO world and helping people in Kakuma or in Darfur. But this person did a degree in engineering and so they're not applying anything that they did in school. What happened there? It was not a particular interest to them. They, they found they found interest in doing something else. They found interest in painting. They found interest in helping people. They found interest in, in, um, in, 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 in engaging with people as opposed to dealing with machines. So once again, interest is something we rarely talk about. We are not always very lucky to get into areas that we're interested in. But if you're fortunate enough to be thinking about your career in this season, if you can understand what areas naturally interest you, and if you can end up going into a career that's actually of interest to you, then you're likely to succeed. The fifth one is your motivation. These are some of the things that drive you. Um, what, is, what, is, what is aligned to your values? I like to say today that um, um, East African breweries, the, 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 the beer company is a great company, but not all of you on the call today, even if you got a job there, would quickly jump and work for EA Beer. Why? Because for some reason you're not very comfortable with the prospects of being in a company that is selling alcohol. And alcohol for you is, is not a product that you want to be associated with. So while EABL might be a great company, might pay you a lot of money, you feel for some reason it doesn't resonate with your values and it doesn't motivate you. You don't feel like being a salesman selling alcohol will be something that motivates you. That is a personal choice, but you cannot, you cannot brush it away as, as something that we should not consider. And so, Whatever drives you, whatever values that you have intrinsic should determine the career you go into. If you love people, if you love um, helping people, if you can be in a career that you can enjoy that value, you will be in a career that will be fulfilling. So friends, these five things, I like to say are the five things, if you can sit down and reflect on these five things and decide that these are the five things that help me, that, 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 that tick a box when it comes to my career, then you'll be in the right career. 
So once we have all these ingredients right, and now we are clear, these are, the, these are the areas I need to focus on based on my personality, based on my ability, based on my interest, based on my motivation, based on the skills I have, I think I want to go into a job in sales. So you're probably then going to be looking at Safaricom as an employer to go work for. And so what do you then, then need to do? Chances are you probably need to put together your CV because that is what we will be reviewing um, when we are looking at people who could potentially work for us. And so what I've done is I've put together some pointers for you to help you as you craft your CV. So what's a good CV? Um, I say get noticed, get shortlisted. So today all of you put together your CVs. Unfortunately, what we see as, as, as recruiters, as talent professionals, is we see CVs that look so similar. We see CVs that are not different from each other. And, and therefore, you will not get noticed. It, gets, it disappears in the pile of CVs that we receive online. So the new, the new, the new age uh, CVs are not necessarily just about following the standard format that your fathers and mothers put together long ago and what you were trained to, to put together in university in, in, in high school. These new CVs are coming up and you need to be aware of this. So I talk about the format and I see many people going for very fancy looking, C, very fancy looking fonts in their CVs. What I say is use simple formats use consistent format across your, your CV. Um, get into the habit of doing in consistent indentation. And I'll show you a sample CV just now. When you talk about having um, your, your, the, the name of the company that you work for being on the side of the, of the, of the, of the CV, let that be consistent with all the, the companies that you worked for. The key sections of your CV will typically be the name, your contact information at the top, your info, your email. The problem with many of your CVs is that, and I bet if I asked you in the, seat, on the, on the, on the call here, all of you probably have, what is my sex? What is my age? What is my marital nope. status? Nope. None of that, sorry? None of that information is actually critical when we're shortlisting because you rarely find a, a job advert at Safaricom saying, we're looking for a female who is 35 years old, who is married. We will rarely be looking for, we will rarely be indicating that in the job description. And therefore, you putting it in your CV is actually just a waste of space. A waste of space which could be utilized to include skills that are, we are actually looking for. So what I'd like to say at the beginning of this page is that your CV is the response to the job description. Your CV is an answer to the job description that you probably have seen online, the job advert. So your answer, which is a CV, should be answering questions that have actually been asked in the JD. So many times the JD, like I said, is not asking for your age, is not asking for your sex. And just so you know, by putting some of this additional information, you're excluding yourself from a process because the recruiters in, in some, most organizations are human beings, I like to believe. And they are going to be likely biased when they see information that does not resonate with them. For instance, if you're applying for manager position and you're only 26 and they say, no, 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 no. There's no way this guy who's 26 or this lady who's 26 that they can possibly do this managerial position. They're too young. Who said? But you directed them to your age by putting it there. And therefore you eliminated yourself from the process. So what I'm saying is remove things that will inevitably bias you or unfortunately bias you bias a recruiter, um, yet it was not necessary. So what I keep saying is that don't put that irrelevant information. At the top of your CV, what you want to focus on is a summary of the competencies and skills that this organization is looking for. Um, you want to also quickly put in place your career summary and you want to put your education background. These are the key areas. And I, like I said, I'll show you a format that has all these sections, but how you present it is important. The CVs of the future today um, need you to have keywords. What do I mean by keywords? The different organizations that you'll be applying for or applying to will speak a particular language. The way they describe a salesperson is not the same way this other organization will describe a salesperson. They might have certain terminologies that, are, that, reason, that, 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 that resonate with the organization. So my advice to you is try and customize your CV to speak the same language as that organization. If you use 
terminologies that are only familiar with the organization that you work with, you will not get noticed. We will not be able to pick you up. So read the JD, read the job description, read the job advert, understand or highlight the, the, the terminologies that they're using and use those terminologies in your CV. Use their vocabulary. Again, I talk about relevance. The job advert is a question and your CV is the answer. Utilize the job advert to capture key skills required. Look at the, look at the line by line in that CV and, and in that JD and see what skills it is that they're looking for. This sales job is looking for people who have stakeholder engagement. This CV, this JD is looking for people who have experience in technology field. This JD is looking for people who have worked with multinationals or who have worked with government. And therefore, you want to be looking at this CV and saying, um, at this JD and saying, I think I have these skills and these are the skills I'm going to highlight at the top of my, my CV. Only include certifications that are relevant for the roles that you're applying for. Some of you are applying for a managerial position or a mid-level position or an entry level, but you feel you see the importance of putting for us your high school scores. No one is looking for high school credentials when you're applying for jobs in companies because look here, once again, the job description is the question, your CV is the answer. Very rarely, unless it's a very entry level job, are we saying we're looking for people in this job with a minimum of a B plus. If they ask for people with a minimum of a B plus, then they are concerned about your high school scores. But if they are not, there is no reason why you need to give them the fact that you went to Kamahoha High School and that you got a B minus. It's not important because it's not relevant information. All you're doing is filling up a CV with irrelevant information. Some of you will tell us the high school you went to. Some of you will tell us that you were bell ringers or that you were the school captain. All of that is not valuable information when you're looking for a job because it's not being requested for. Focus on the information that is actually relevant. Include references only if asked for references. A lot of you in this call have a section of your CV that has references. Unless the, 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 the recruiter asked for references, include it. Most times the recruiter will ask for references further down in the process. When we've identified you, when we've seen that you're the candidate of choice, then we will, then we will ask you for your references. I say keep your, your CV simple. A lot of you have only worked five years, three years. Your CV is three pages long. I've worked for a total of 12 years. My CV is one page, and I'll show you just now. How have I done that? I've worked for very many companies, but my CV is only one page. How did I do that? So I like to say, your CV is not an opportunity for you to capture your life history. No, your CV is an opportunity for you to capture relevant experiences that the companies that you're applying for are looking for. So don't over-exaggerate. Don't lie about your achievements. Give the information that is truthful and chances are you'll get selected for the jobs that you apply for. So let me just show you a sample CV. This is my CV. What you see at the top here is my name. You can see the address of where I live, my phone number, and my email address. You do not know how old I am. You don't know whether I'm a male or a female. All you know is that if you need to get in touch with me, all the information you require is there. You don't even see something that is in all your CVs. You don't see a PO box. Because which companies today are actually receiving applications by post box? Most likely none. So why are you including there your post office information? No one really is going to be using that information. So once again, put information that is relevant. I then at the top of my CV include a quick summary of my experience. I also sometimes say that this, this section is not that important because a lot of times most of you put very generic information that is not as relevant and therefore, most recruiters will just gloss over this section. The most important section of your CV after this is this section of competencies, the relevant competencies. Where did I choose or where did I get these competencies? I got these competencies from the job I was applying for at the time. At the time, this job I was applying for required people with early talent program design experience. They required somebody who had healthcare recruitment experience. They required somebody who had a consulting experience. And therefore, I only highlighted the competencies and experiences that I knew were relevant for that job. I then include the companies that I worked for. I've worked for Safaricom, 
I've worked for General Electric, I've worked for Deloitte, I've worked for um, a company in Kenya called Career Connection. The, as you can see, I've, I used to do a lot of things in these jobs, but I haven't enumerated everything. What I've done is I've picked up the six or five things that I think are actually important. Further down in my CV, you notice, I don't have that much information. Why? Because as the more junior I was, the, the less relevant the things that I have to share on my CV. And therefore, I only include what I think is going to be of value to the people reviewing my CV. It doesn't mean that because it's a CV, it has to be 10 bullet points. Capture for them what is relevant. You can see there that I include my education, the, the university that I went to, my master's degree, and my undergrad. What you also notice is that you do not see the year that I graduated. Because you know what? I'm also trying to make sure that you don't still find out based on the year that I graduated. If you're smart, you can compute and find out when, how old I am. But again, I've removed that information for you because it's not relevant. There's really any job that asking, we're looking for people who graduated between the year 2002 and 2005. I don't know if any of you have seen such job adverts in the papers, no. They just ask, we're looking for somebody who has graduated from a reputable university. And therefore, I have put the university there and I have put for them the degree. That is the only information they require. I have also included for them the certifications that I have done. These certifications, I've done many more, than, many more certifications, but I have only included for them certifications that I think are relevant for the job that I'm applying for. I've also included for them the languages that I can speak. I haven't included the fact that I can speak Swahili or that I can speak my native language because that language is not relevant for the job I was applying for. The job I was applying for was a job in Europe and the job required me to speak French and therefore I've included Included the fact that I speak a bit of French. So this, my friends, is a CV of somebody who started his career slightly before 2009, and we're now in 2020, what? 2020, and I have managed to squeeze it all in one page. So for you who has a CV that is three pages long, yet you worked for only three years, it's, it's, not, it's not necessary. So assume that you have now been selected, you have, you have a very nice CV, the line manager saw your CV, and now they've selected you for, for a job. Remember, this CV also has keywords that I know the recruiters who's, who are going to be shortlisting me using the systems that they have, because this, the recruiters of today are using very cutting edge solutions that have things called algorithms in the back end. So what they're able to do is that we're quickly able to search and pick out keywords. So if I'm looking for a job, they will only come in and say recruitment technology. They will say someone with assessment experience. They will say somebody with organization design. Chances are they will do a search on my CV in the, plat in the platform that they have, and my CV will come up at the top. And that, my friends, is how you make sure that your CV stands out, by having keywords that you know these people are going to be looking for. And remember, I gave you the tip, use their language. So assuming you've been selected, the next thing is for you to go for an interview. So I'm gonna gloss over the interview process. The number one thing I tell candidates before they go out for an interview is prepare. It sounds so easy, but most people just don't prepare, prepare enough. So once again, I'm going to reference the job description or the job advert. Print out that job advert and let that be your Bible. Let that be what you review as your baseline. On the other hand, I'm also asking you to find out if you can get a, a copy of the company's strategy, the department strategy. Go online, Google, find out, do a search, find out what is this company aiming to do? What, is, what are they chasing? What, are they, what, is their, what is their culture? Once you put together this information, that is a starting point for you to start preparing for your, inter, for your interview. Once you're able to understand what the challenges this organization is facing. For instance, today you've learned about Safaricom's values, you've learned about Safaricom's mission and their vision. If you come to an interview and you understand that at the back of your mind, even the way you respond to questions will be slightly different. And I say stand out, get selected. And this is how you stand out, by having information that not everybody who comes for that interview will have. I promise you, if you can go out and find out what the strategy of that organization is, you'll be very different. So, 
Also, in addition, I say, find out the history of the role. Is this role being replaced? Is it a role that has always been there? What is the issue? Why is this role important to this organization? How can you find out this information? Sometimes you have friends who work in those organizations that you're applying to. Find out this information. Sometimes you have um, a friend of a friend who works in that organization. Try and find out this information. So assuming that you've done that homework, and it's the first thing I talk about, preparation, a good interview process will involve something called CBI questions. What is a CBI question? It's a competency-based interview or a competency-based um, um, question. So basically, we'll be asking you for tangible examples of things that you have done that are relevant for the job that you're applying for. For instance, if you're applying for a sales job, I'll say, tell me about a time when you have closed a deal of this magnitude. A good recruiter will ask you a question that is retrospective as opposed to a question that is theoretical. Because if I have three people in front of me and all of you and went and studied the five steps of doing a sales process, the following day and I ask all of you, tell me the four steps of doing a sales process and the three of you give me the same response. Who's the better candidate? I'm unable to do that as a recruiter. I'm, able, I'm unable to distinguish who of the three is the better candidate. However, if I ask you the question, tell me about a time that you closed a deal that was complex, that, 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 that involved numerous stakeholders. Chances are the way you re respond to that question and the way this other person responds is going to be very different. And therefore, that is the point of asking a competency-based question. Mm -hmm. So I ask you, how will you know what questions they're going to ask? Remember, I told you, get a copy of the job description. Go line by line, finding out what are the skills these people are looking for. When I look at this JD, I can see they're asking for somebody who's going to be engaging with the stakeholders, engaging with the county engaging with, with uh, universities. Therefore, it means that experience working with universities is going to be critical. Experience working with counties is going to be critical. And therefore, if they ask me, give me a tangible example of a time when you sold a product to the county, you will have real examples. So what you, in essence, have is a leakage to the questions that will be asked in the interview. In addition, what you also have, by virtue of studying the strategy of the organization, you also know what are some of their challenges. You also know what are some of the things that they're chasing. You know what the future of that organization is. And so what you could have done is that you could have gone ahead and done some research on some of the things that can resolve the problems that they have, okay? So that if I ask you a question, tell me some of the trends in doing sales process in a more effective way you will know that question is going to come because you know that the sales company that you're working for is looking at improving the sales process because you looked at their strategy. So therefore, if you can take some time to study some of the trends, find out what are, these, what are some of the newer sales, sales platforms that these companies are looking for, by the time you're going to the interview, you're equipped with all this information. So all through this majority of the question section of your interview, you'll be asked competency-based questions. And the way to ask, to respond to those questions is using a STAR approach. Describe and tell us what was the situation? What was the task at hand? So we, was, we were supposed to be selling this product um, and the, the, the company was really keen on us improving our sales targets from this amount to this amount. The task at hand was that we needed to sell these products within a period of one week. The action that I took is that I engaged my multiple stakeholders over this period of time, and this resulted in this particular sales outcome. So in what I've done in a very quick space is I've taken us through the situation, the task, the action, and the result. And if you really want to make it very crisp and very strong, you can also say, after doing all of that, this was the learning that I achieved from doing this process. If you respond to a question like that, the line manager looking at you and talking to you will be very impressed by the structure with which you respond to the question. If I can take a step back, most of the time when you come for an interview, we'll ask you, tell us about yourself. But most of the time, I will not ask you that question. What I will say is, tell me your understanding of this role and how your experience has prepared you for this role that you've applied for. So what that means is that you need to take time to understand the role. Take us through your experience from the beginning to now but don't take us through, don't, don't walk us through your CV as if you're giving us a story because we can see your CV. 
What you need to do instead is take us through the experiences, explaining what competencies you have gained as you went through in your journey. When I was a teaching assistant at this school, I gained this experience. And I think that experience is very relevant for the job that I've applied for. I then transitioned to this job, and this is what I did. And from this job, I gained this experience and these competencies that I think are important for this job. So I'm not just giving a story of I moved from this job to this job. I'm actually extracting the meat from those experiences because I know that is what you're looking for. And how do I know what you're looking for? Because I have the job description. I know the skills you're looking for, okay? So let's, let's scratch that whole part of, of the questions we've captured. And if you, if you answer it with that approach, you'll be good with any question. So typically we ask, what, what salary do you want? A lot of you say, give me any salary. Not a good response. What you want to do is get an indication of the salary that the company is paying, find out what ranges that they, they, they give and propose that salary. Another question that we typically ask you is, tell us about your weaknesses. A bad recruiter will ask you that question. A good recruiter will ask you, tell us about your development areas. What are some of the things that your line manager or the person you worked with in the past pointed out that you need to improve going forward? A lot of you will say, um, I think I'm a perfectionist. That is a typical response that does not fly. It has, tells us that you're not authentic. It tells us that you're not, you're not self-aware. It tells us that you don't know about yourself as a leader. And whether or not you're in a junior position or a senior position, you're a leader. And any good leader is self-aware. So do you know that they were going to ask you this question? Yes, they are always going to ask you a question about your development areas. And therefore, take time to reflect on the example that you want to share with them. What I like to say is don't share a controversial example. Don't share a controversial weakness, which will knock you out of the process. If this job requires somebody who is organized, then you come and say, I think my weakness is that I'm a bit disorganized. You're out of the process. So reflect on an area that you feel is not controversial and point out to the line manager that, look, this is an area I'm aware of. I have put in place some measures to resolve that problem. And over time, I think I've seen some improvement. All right? So that's the issue of how to, do, how to answer that question. The last question is, the last point I want to tell you is relax. Because you'll prepare, because you'll have all the tips that Tabby and I have shared with you today, you'll be a little bit more relaxed you'll be a little bit more prepared. Don't go into the interview and be proud. Some of you sometimes will go into an interview and realize that the questions being asked by the panelists are not as smart. Just because you're the smartest in the room, don't be rude. Be courteous, smile. I like to say people buy from people who they like. If you're somebody who comes in and you're charming and you smile and you give a joke here and there, chances are you'll get the job. But, don't, but the only caveat I give is don't give a joke if you're not a good, um, a good um, comedian, otherwise you just look funny, yeah? If you asked um, the question, do you have any questions for us? A lot of you say, no, 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 I'm fine. I don't have any questions. Bad move. Take that question, turn it around, use it to your advantage. For instance, you could say, do you people have appetite to implement this kind of system that I saw companies of your size and nature are utilizing? How do you know that they are struggling with this issue? You looked at their strategy. You looked at their issues. So you went ahead and found out some new systems that people are using. So you propose and you're finding out, is this something that you're looking at implementing? And they'll be very impressed. Wow, this person has gone ahead to find out information about, about the, the organization. You could also ask the question, what is, what, what, is, what is the biggest challenge that you're facing right now that you're hoping this, this role will come and fix or come and sort out for you? By them responding that question, you'll find out some of the things that they are looking for. And maybe you'd not mentioned it in, in your interview, in your responses. So now you have an opportunity again to respond and say, it's funny you say that that's what you're looking for, because you know what? I've done this particular thing in the past before, and I think I can bring that value to you. So by asking that question, you've turned it around and gotten an opportunity to sell yourself once again. So prepare, prepare, prepare. You will always be asked a competency-based question in a good company. There's some frequently asked questions, but more importantly, relax. Prepare and you will be relaxed. Now, um, before I conclude, some of you are probably wondering, so I want to work for Safaricom. How, what are some of the skills that I'm looking for in this season and that Safaricom is looking for? Safaricom, like you heard, is becoming a digital solutions provider. We're no longer primarily a telco. We are, we're looking to transition ourselves 
to be a, tel um, a digital solution provider. So my competition at Safaricom is Facebook, Google, Amazon. Those are the people I'm competing for, uh, competing with for talent. And so I'm looking for software developers. Just last month, while other companies are firing people, while other companies are downsizing, I just recruited 19 software developers. Why? Because this is a skill that continues to be important for Safaricom. I'm looking for data analysts. I'm looking for statistic statisticians, people who can do statistical modeling. We're looking for people who can do robotic process automation. We're looking for people who can do cloud computing. Cloud is now the new thing around, around databases. We're looking for people who have experience with user experience, user interface designers, content creators. These are some of the skills of the future and the skills that Safaricom is looking for today. So I tell Tabby every day, if you can find for me someone who's really good at this, who's a person living with disability, and they're really good, we will hire them. We will get them an opportunity. But unless you have these skills, unfortunately, these are some, these are, this is what the company is looking for right now. Some of the other areas, not so much. And so what you want to be doing then is how do you prepare yourself in the next year so that when, when Chris and Tabby are recruiting, you're ready. Go online, enroll yourself in some of those data analyst, data analytics courses. Some of them are free. Some of them you pay a small amount of money. Pick up on Python, software development course. Um, pick up on some of the courses online that are teaching cloud computing. Do these courses. Go to Blaze platform. We have some free, free, free courses that are up there that we are actually giving to the youth to, to study. So you have no excuse today. On YouTube, you can learn some of these things yourself. Be self-driven. Some of the traits we'll be looking for in the youth is somebody who has self-taught some of these things. We just concluded a graduate program and we were not looking for people who have finished university. We we're looking for self-taught professionals in these areas. And therefore, if you have a skill in this area and you're actually good, whether or not you have a degree or a diploma, we will hire you. So that, my friends, is um, the skills of the future. So let me quickly just take you through our process at Safaricom for recruitment. If you want a job at Safaricom, don't write to me an email because I cannot take your CV via email. What works is I will post a job on the career portal, www.safaricom.co.ke slash careers. We will post a job on the career portal. Most of the time, a job will run for five days. A recruiter will receive your, the, the applications. We will then do a, a, a long list. We will share that long list with the line manager and engage and see which of these people do you actually want to see further. The ones we will shortlist, we will then take them further into the process. A lot of times I will do either a video interview or an online assessment. I'll send you a case study. I'll make you do an online video interview. And from there, I will cut down the number to maybe five or four people. I will then invite you for face-to-face -face interview. In the times of COVID, we're not using face-to-face -face anymore. So I'll invite you for an online interview where you'll be sitting across the table from, from me through Zoom and we will have a conversation and we will shortlist you and we will give you the job if you're the right person. We will then do some, uh, we normally at Safaricom have a risk check process. We will do a background check process. You can imagine working for Safaricom, you're handling very sensitive information. And so we want to make sure the people working for us don't have a criminal record. So we will do this check before I give you an offer. I need to make sure that you are clean. You've not been involved with Al-Shabaab. After I'm sure that you're not involved with Al-Shabaab, I'll give you an offer letter and you'll join us at Safaricom. And that, my friends, is the process. And all of this typically takes about 40 to 50 days uh, for me to conclude a, a, um, an, a recruitment process. So that, my friends, is recruitment at Safaricom. Those are some tips I hope are going to be helpful for you as you um, look for jobs in the future. And I hope that session was helpful. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. I think everybody in this session can agree with me that, man, that session requires, it deserves a standing ovation. You covered pretty much everything. And uh, Kemboy Samuel agrees with me. He says, thank you, Atindo. I have learned a lot on CV development, how to be prepared for interview and self-awareness. Job description is the question and my CV is the answer. Wow, extensive is what I can say about your presentation. Thank you. So I think, I think now we can welcome questions. There are already so many questions in the chat. Um, 
Can I read out the first one for you? Happy so, to receive the questions. So I'm a medium experienced developer. What languages, um, sorry, what languages, if you know any, should one begin cultivating interest in? S uh, so someone said they're a medium? Medium, they have medium experience uh, when it comes to developing. Right. Medium, are you talking about the platform, the online uh, website called Medium? Or, um, is Medium a language? No, he's not too experienced. I think that's what he's oh, trying Oh, Medium, to sorry. You mean like, oh, wow, sorry. Yeah, Medium, just Medium. <laughs> I was getting lost. I was like, I probably, I thought I'd heard about all the, all the programming languages. No, but yeah. no. So there are medium. So there are medium um, program. Uh, just say that. So now, now that I'm understand, understanding what you're asking, ask the question again. Okay, I'm a medium experienced uh, developer. Mm -hmm. What languages should one begin cultivating interest in? Okay, okay. I think it's it's no it's no it's no it's no uh, secret that Python is going to be big, especially because of the data science piece. Um, if you can if you can write in Python, it's 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 quite easy. Uh, there, there's a number of others. Um, I think JavaScript is something that we're always looking for. Those are the two I want to call out, but there's so many others. Um, uh, we're also looking for people who can, who can, who can work with, um, dev, who can work on solutions that are DevOps. DevOps is basically um, the end-to-end -end of software development. So if you can learn solutions and, and platforms that are across the value chain of DevOps, you will be in good stead. So the Kubernetes, some of the Docker, some of these platforms that allow for collaboration, for containerization. I'm not a technical guy, but I've heard these terminologies. So if you are able to, to pick up on languages and solutions that allow for the whole DevOps piece, you'll be in better stead. I hope that helps you. Yeah, I think I think you've answered his question. Uh, that was Derek, and he'd also like to know: Is it wise to respond? Let me think about it after the salary question. The thing is this: um, an interview is probably an hour long. We are probably interviewing another person right after you. Now, what it tells me when you say "let me think about it," you didn't come prepared. Um, I mean, you knew you were coming for this job. You knew that you knew the, the range of the salary. Um, so let me think about it. I'm, I'm, the question I'd be wondering is, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about whether you want the job? Are you thinking about the, 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 the figure that you want? It's not very clear to me. So I think to be on the safer side, come prepared with a figure. Give a range. Um, a lot of times people come and give me a, give, tell me, you know what, just give me anything. I say, no, 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 the space I have here it's not a space for narrative, it's a space for a figure. So that's how, I be, that's how I cheekily make sure you give me the response. But anyway, the point of me asking for the figure is because we want to know um, if, we, it's, if the job is worth your while. If the job is only paying 20,000 and what you're expecting is 50,000, then I know I can't afford you. So the other way to go around it is to say, look, I'm looking for 100,000, but more importantly, I'm looking for an opportunity to learn. So if, if, if 100,000 is out of range, I'm willing for us to, to have a conversation. But the truth is I'm looking more for an opportunity to learn. I'm looking to be part of the organization. I like what you're doing and therefore that's what's more important. But remember that, that response is only based on all of you know where your shoe pinches most. If it will not be enough money for you. Wow, wow. And um, what, and um, what if you don't have any experience or your experience is totally different from the job description? What should you do? All right, so my question would be, why are you in that interview in the first place? Why are you even applying for the job in the first place? Remember where we started? What we said is sit down and reflect on your experiences, reflect on your abilities, reflect on your, 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 your interests. My assumption is by the time you're applying for a job, it is aligned to who you are as a person. We rarely do that. We just apply for jobs. You just go to the papers and you apply for a job. I want a job, I want a job. I want to challenge you to apply for a job that actually leverages your giftings, leverages the skills that you already have today. Chances are you'll be successful. So don't apply for a job you're not, you're not skilled for. Because I will, I will, unfortunately, I will not even shortlist you if you don't have the skills. Makes sense, that makes sense. 
Um, okay, next question. How can I get to know the requirement for TVET courses for persons with lower and minimum qualifications? I will be happy to identify vulnerable persons with disabilities who will need skills like construction, wiring, plumbing. Um, yeah, I think the question is, how can I get to know the requirement for TVET courses? If you have Tabby, lower or minimum qualifications. Yeah, Tabi, you, know, you want to take this one? I'm, 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 yes. I'm a yes. bit lost. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it all depends on the advert. Uh, again, uh, to what Chris said, you must adhere to the, 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 the qualifications required um, when a job is advertised. Yeah, so each and every time a job is posted, the requirements are actually posted on it. But um, to this, um, to answer you, the latest one I saw was a C minus and even up to a D so to speak. Remember, we are, this is, this is TVET is a, a social vehicle to inclusion. Uh, people who did not make it to university, cut, uh, cut off points for university, are being given another chance to be able to make a living and to be able to actually um, make, uh, you know, um, earn, earn a living for themselves. And therefore, um, the qualifications are never high there. Uh, but look at every individual application. They, you know, it, it, it actually indicates what kind of qualification, whether it's a C minus or, you know, whether it's a C plus or whatever it is. Just make sure you apply according to the, you know, the qualifications required. And um, I would like to refer you to the TVET website. You can actually just dial www.tvet. You will find... Uh, information and more courses um, that you know you can refer the person uh, you are referring to thank you tabby that we will appreciate that link so let's jump on to the next question some organizations have a form that you fill before for instance uh the un that asks for age and you can't get around it is this a form of discrimination yeah, that's a very good question. So yes, um, it's not a form of discrimination. It's just their way of collecting information and trying to have a very tidy recruitment process. So once again, depending on the organization, do not say that Chris told me not to share my age and therefore this form, I will not fill it. If you don't fill the form, you will not be shortlisted. So there, in, in that organization's case, <laughs> their, their form is the question and what you feel is the answer. So by all means, please fill it correctly, fill it honestly. Um, the truth is, and I'm not gonna lie to you, in some cases, yes, you might be eliminated from a process because of that kind of information being captured. But there are organizations, especially um, some of the very um, progressive organizations that are not concerned about things like age, that are not concerned about whether you're a male or a female. Um, but if you do end up applying for a company that requires that information, give it to them and hopefully your skills trump any of that other stuff that they have, they have captured and they've asked for. Okay. Okay. Fill out your forms correctly. Thank you. All right. Next, say I, a developer, and I just, okay, I think they meant to say I'm a developer and I just developed a solution for a certain niche for you guys at Safaricom. How do I approach you guys to offer it? How do I pitch? Yeah, it's a good question. I think we do get these kind of um, things all the time. Um, you can imagine being Safaricom, there's many people who are looking to, to, to share ideas. So Tabby, I think we, we do have a channel. I, 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 can, I can share at a later time um, with, the, with the host of today and yourself, Ella, um, the email that people can send innovative ideas. I know we do have a channel uh, through which we collect some of these ideas. We'd appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So does the job title matter when looking for a job? For instance, currently I'm an advisor, uh, but another organization is looking for an officer. Mm, it's a good question. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a very good question. And this is now the tips and tricks of the game, guys. That sometimes the way you call your job in your company, like I said, 
an advisor in, in KPMG or in a, in a company that you work for, if you use that title to, to apply for another job, it might not be understood. So this is a trick and you need to use it sparingly. My title at Safaricom is advisor, but the company I'm applying for calls the job a manager. So sometimes what I would do is say advisor in brackets, manager, so that my JD, my, because remember, my CV is customized for this company. So I'll say advisor, the equivalent of this job after reviewing the experience required, the scope of this job, my title is similar to this job that I'm applying for. So advisor, I see you guys are calling it manager, I'm calling myself manager. It, I mean, it's neither here nor there, it might be seen to be cheeky, but I'm telling you, remember, it's a competitive market out there. So long as you're clear that your job is very similar to that job, then in, in brackets, this job is similar to manager. But if, you're, if it's an advisor and it's, it's a very junior job, don't call it director if it's not director. So that's why I say use it sparingly. Um, but I think, I think there's, there's room for you to tweak your title to suit, but make sure you still maintain your, your original title because what they'll do is that they'll call the company to check, was this person actually an advisor in the company? And then they would say yes. But if you say I was a director and we do a, a background check and we find out that you didn't, you're not actually director, then there's a problem. Yeah, that's not going to look so good on you. That question came from Kimboya Samuel, and he's asking so many questions. It's impressive. So he has another question directed to Tabby. How do you manage disability disclosure that may deny you the job? Tabby? Um, thank you so much, Kimboy. Um, Just to start off, that uh, disclosure does not deny you the job. In fact, it might just earn you the job. Um, on our applications, and we do that very deliberately, we do it because we are an equal um, employer, equal opportunity employer, we do indicate that persons with disability are encouraged to apply. And we exactly mean that. We don't mean um, that as a means to, to, to actually uh, get you uh, disclosed and then we disqualify you. We want to give you an opportunity. Remember I said uh, at the beginning, one of our pillars is inclusive. We want to be reflective um, of the communities we serve. So we want to be reflective. We want to have persons with disabilities because they are part of our population, because they add value when they come into the organization. Um, so when, when we, um, we ask uh, people to disclose, it, it, is for the simple reason that we want to understand your disability. We want to understand your needs so that when you come into the organization, we are ready for you. Remember, there are thousands and thousands of different disabilities. And for, for it would be a shame for us to onboard you. Then we realize that we, you know, we, we are not ready for you. Yeah. So uh, we normally ask, you know, uh, for you to disclose, you know, are you a person of so short stature, for example, so that we can make sure that by the time you report, we have a foot rest for you. You know, are you a person who is visually impaired? Then we ensure that we, we have the necessary uh, uh, software, JAWS, yeah, and, 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 and a workstation ready for you. Um, so, and we've also prepared the line managers, yeah, to, 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 um, to be able to know how to, um, uh, you know, um, introduce you to the team and sensitize everyone around about your disability so that you don't feel, you don't come there and feel unwanted. You come there and feel part of the team. So, um, that is how we manage, um, disclosure. We would like people to disclose. So that, because that enables us to actually facilitate, facilitate their smooth entry uh, and, and, and comfort in the organization. And Tabby, the other, the other interesting thing is that many organizations now are looking to increase the number of representation of persons with, dis persons with disability. And therefore, by disclosing it, you actually increase your chances of being, being given a chance to be interviewed. Okay. So while, while we're still on that disability issue, I'd like to ask, um, other, than, um, other than people with disability, 
what other diverse diverse groups uh, do you prioritize or do you advocate for at Safaricom? Is it just people with disability or how else are you diverse? Okay, uh, if, if, if you remember the first, um, the tree, uh, the tree analogy I shared, um, mm -hmm. I said, you know, there are many ways we differ. And, and, and uh, some of the ways are, are just, you know, invisible. So you, you don't, you don't uh, realize that, you know, that's a form of diversity, but indeed it is your perspective, your thinking, your skills. So for example, uh, Chris has mentioned that uh, if you, have, you do not qualify for a certain job, don't apply, yeah? yeah? So yeah. we ensure that uh, if we advertise for marketing, then you have the marketing qualifications. If we mm -hmm. apply, you, are, we, you know, we advertise for a, a software developer, then it is those kind of skills that we are looking for. So right. um, we have diverse skills uh, that enable us to achieve our business objective. Yeah, gender yeah. is one one of them. Yeah, we we are looking at getting to fifty fifty by the year twenty twenty five in terms of management. Yeah, but on the overall, we are fifty fifty. So gender is another uh, very key um, uh, dimension that many companies are striving to achieve. Yeah. yeah. So uh, religion, you know, sometimes people look at uh, religion it, and, 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 and it's, it's very um, subtle in organization because you've got to respect people's religions such that when you have, um, for example, uh, functions um, and, and you call for prayer, then you give these people an opportunity to pray as well. So you don't assume that we are all Christians because Kenya is 80% Christian, yeah? And these are the small things that make people have brand love for the for the for the for the for the organization. Yeah, that they feel they are part of it. That even if I am different from you, I am a Muslim. I am Hindu. Yeah, I I I feel I belong because I am given um, an opportunity to actually be part and parcel of every activity. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, just to mention a few. Age is what we are here for. So in our organization, Safaricom, we have diverse age groups. All the ages I mentioned there, we have them in Safaricom, from the baby boomers to the perennials. Yeah, so yes. So those are the, some of the, 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 diverse, um, uh, the diversity we have in the organization. Okay. Um, Michelle is very grateful to both you and Chris for for this session, it's very informative. So she also has a question. She asks, what, uh, what am I supposed to do if I have zero experience uh, job-wise and I'm trying to write a CV? How should I go about that? I think Chris can take this one. Yeah. So assuming you have no experience, it, it, it means that um, you're probably straight from school. Now the assumption is this, and this is again, I mean, it's, it might be too late to give you this advice if you already left school. But if you're talking to anyone out there, if you're in high school, I mean, if you're in university, I think it's not acceptable for you to finish university without volunteering, without doing an internship somewhere. Most universities, most, most colleges ask you to go and volunteer somewhere. So there is some experience that you might have gotten when you went and volunteered at the hospital, when you went to the, to the, to the, the children's home. All of those are real relevant experiences that you can actually enumerate. And I, the, the caveat I have as well is, if you are applying for uh, an entry level job, chances are they're concerned about what you received in university in high school as your grade. They're probably concerned about um, the university that you went to. They're even probably concerned about your age because they don't want this job is a job for entry level graduates and the, the cap for the age is 27. So chances are they will be asking you to include that information on your CV. So while I was giving this advice, I said, you need to be looking at the organization that you're applying to and apply accordingly and, 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 and adjust your CV and your, your profile accordingly. Your CV is literally a living document. So to ad straight advice for you is draw as much experience from the volunteering, from the, the internships that you did, because 
that, my friends, is what's at least the experience that you have. That experience gave you something. Even if it's the church stuff you do when you're in the choir, that's experience. Hopefully you, you help out, you lead in, in some, some committees here and there, that's experience. But if you have nothing at all, then your chances of being selected for anything are really slim. And you need to start, first of all, by volunteering because you need to get some more stories to give so that when you come to an interview, you have something to share. Otherwise, if you have nothing to share, then your chances are going to be very slim of being selected for anything. And that's just being, being very honest with you. Yeah, everybody's out to look for the, uh, everybody's looking out for their best interest. So even your, the company that's looking to employ you, it wouldn't look good on you if you had no experience and still expect to get a job from them. So yeah, that makes sense. That and makes yes, sense. yes, your third year attachment does count as experience. I think that's still from someone. From else. Derek. His name is Derek. From Infinix Derek. Smart 2. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Nice name, yeah. Infinix. Yeah, it's amazing. We should all change our names to our phone's names. <laughs> anyway, uh, Michelle was, was it Michelle? No, it was Raul Min asking mm -hmm. about the salary issue. If you have no idea what the rates uh, that the, that company offers, is it okay to ask for a quotation? Okay, so a quotation would only mean that uh, a quotation is a consultancy that you're going for. Um, and it's you to give the quotation, not them. It's you telling them for these services, this is my quotation. But um, this is what I like to say. You've been invited for the interview, just do some homework. I promise you there's something called the six degrees of separation. For sure, you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who works there. So you can find out a range. And if you're not able to find out, sometimes go online. Glassdoor might have some information, glassdoor.com. But worst case scenario, say you're unable to totally give any, to get any information, then go in and say, you know what? I am willing to take whatever you have that, because most organizations have salary structures. So chances are they have already agreed on a salary, a salary range for that, particular, for that particular job. So you know what? you hopefully then you you'll kind of know what you're worth and you'll say you know what give me this amount it's it's an unfortunate place to be because chances are you might end up underselling yourself or overselling yourself which is why i default to do some research but if in the worst case possible you don't have any information then you might just have to give a figure and hope that you land at the right one okay um another question from infinix smart too I am a solo developer, although I do collaboration with some friends from time to time. Can I attach some of my work as evidence for my experience? So at the shortlisting stage, your experience and your might not be as relevant because remember, we're looking at so many CVs at the same time. The platforms that we use to shortlist do not have the capability to see the, the work experience that you have. So the work experience that you have will come much later in the process when, remember I said, Let's first get you through the, the shortlisting stage. Let's get you into the interview room. At the interview room, tell us, guys, I actually have a very nice platform here on my phone. Can I show it to you? At that point, you have the chance. But at the interview stage, I mean, at the shortlisting stage, don't, don't fill your CV with so much content that will be, think about a job, think about a billboard. I like to give example of a billboard, a Safaricom billboard. It doesn't have so many, so many words. It has maximum six words very high level. The terms and conditions are at the bottom there. We don't give you so much content. We give you only the highlights and that's what your CV needs to be. Your CV needs to be just highlights. When you come into the interview, tell us the terms and conditions. Okay. I hope that helps. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that does. So uh, we are out of questions. Unless somebody would like to ask a question now, you could type it in the in the group chat. Ella, Ella, Michelle yeah. had a Michelle had a question. Uh huh. Yeah, Michelle had a question. Let me see if I can find it. Um, someone called Michelle was asking. Um, uh -huh. uh, she said, "Thank you so much, uh, Chris and Madam Tabby, for the wonderful session. I have a question." What if you have zero experience job-wise? How do you write such a CV? 
Um, we 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 already answered that question, I think. Oh, you did. Okay. Cool, cool, yes, cool. we did. Okay. So, but Infinix Smart Two, aka Derek, would also like to know. Um, okay, he says. So in my CV, I'm tied to only list my clients as my experience. For example, I've developed for Cooperative Bank. Uh, what is the question? I do not understand the question. Um, perhaps you can clarify, but it's also not a problem for you to, to indicate in your CV, yes, um, this project with this client, this project with this client, so long as you're not divulging anything sensitive for your clients. This is very typical of consultants. You sometimes have to check with the client if they don't have a problem with you sharing that you've done some work for them. But yes, that is a very good way you can enumerate in, 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 the, in your achievements that I have developed this kind of a solution for this client, developed this solution for this client in a very easy, smart way that's easy to read. That's definitely very valuable and it adds to your credibility. Okay. He says, thank you. His question is Right. Uh, Ella. Yes. Ella, uh, kidogo to kidogo. Yeah, yeah, sure. I want to ask a question. Um, there's someone who was asking a question and, and they were asking, and I don't know if this goes to Tabby or Chris, um, mm -hmm. or both actually, if someone with a visually, you know, someone who has visual impairment has their CV written in Braille, what happens then? Tabby. Hi. Um, exactly to my point, but I, 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 I ha, you know, I was uh, answering the previous question saying, you know, we would like you to actually state um, so that we are able to get ready for you. So if you have your, your CV written in Braille and you cannot uh, uh, have it written in, in the normal you know, um, uh, uh, language, we have people in Safaricom who can read Braille in resources. So you need not worry. Yeah? So what you need to do is just ensure that it gets um, through to us through the various channels and then we will, we will, um, we will deal with it. Thank you, right, Tabby. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and definitely, I, I, said, I said we don't receive CVs through email, but for persons living with disability, we've made some exceptions that we can channel some profiles through the email. Tabby is normally a good champion. Jane, my colleague, is a champion. They will receive profiles of skills that we're looking for, and we will make exceptions, especially where um, a special need is required, special uh, considerations for assessment are required. We definitely try to adjust accordingly for the different mm -hmm. special needs. Yeah. And just to add on to um, uh, the subject of piece of interviewing and presentation, which mm -hmm. I think is very key because um, I hear this all the time from uh, from uh, the youth, is how you present yourself uh, during an interview. You know, um, as Chris said, when you're going for an interview, make sure you do your background check. Yeah. For example. If it is a bank or such an institution, they are still so suit, suit driven. Yeah. So if you go there in a, perhaps in your sweatshirt or your suit, you might not get the job. Yeah. You might just, you know, because <laughs> bias is real. Yeah. You, yeah. They, perhaps they will not tell you you haven't gotten the job because of the way you are dressed. But it's important for you to study um, the organization where you're going for an interview and actually conform to their way of dressing because um, this is very important. First impressions are always very key. Yeah. So, so I, I, I thought I would just drop that, um, that tip as well. Okay. Um, Chris, I think there's one more question for you. Maybe you can tell us what one ought to do to stay, to stay assured of his or her job security. That's after successfully going through the interview and actually getting the job. Um, okay, so there's, they've, started the, they've started the job. They want to have job security. Someone likes to say, um, we, don't like to, we don't like to advise you on job security. We want you to be employ, employment secure. Basically, even if you lose a job with this company, you're still employable. So it's not about the job because no one, and I cannot pretend to tell you today, 
I have the, sec the secret sauce to make sure that the company you work for does not fire you. Companies are going through a lot of challenges in this season. They're making different decisions. But to increase your chances of being one of the people they see as a valuable resource is to have skills that are relevant for the organization. Remember we said, study your organization. Even when you're inside the organization, keep tabs with what it is that the organization is doing. For instance, Safaricom is now looking to become a digital solutions provider. If you're an employee at Safaricom and you're not building skills of the future, then you are also toying on the fence in terms of your job security. But more importantly, if you pick up on some of those skills that are in the industry generally being sought after, you ensure that you're employable and your employment security is secure because even if Safaricom, you lose your job at Safaricom, the next company next door is likely to pick you up. So don't be so focused on job security, focus on employment security. Build on skills of the future. Retool yourself with the skills that are relevant of today. And just to add on to what Chris has said, I think um, the mindset, tool set, and skill set is, a, is very key. Even as you, you, know, you, you stay in the organization, your mind must remain vibrant and agile. You know, you must ask yourself, what books are you reading? You know, um, uh, don't just get there and settle and say, nimepata kazi kwa ivo, nimeka. You know, just continuously upskill yourself. So in terms of the skill set, yeah, look for the next job and look for what it requires you to achieve and begin to work towards it, yeah? So um, just those three things, the mindset must be right, your attitude as well is very key. We sikuja hapo once kutuonyesha umesoma sana, yeah? As Chris said, don't be arrogant, yeah? So those are the things that can keep you going in a job. Just make sure you're learning, you're unlearning the things you need to unlearn so that you create room for more things, yeah? So keep yeah. learning and learning, relearning and unlearning and relearning new things to where the business is going. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much for that tip on employment security. And I think it's safe to say that- Yeah, and Ella, perhaps maybe to add, uh -huh. perhaps, perhaps maybe to add to what Chris and, and Tabi have said, uh, one of the things that I got to learn, uh, it's so simple, but it's so relevant, is the tip about having soft skills. Uh, you know, improve on your soft skills as a person. Like, uh, learn how to speak to people, learn how to talk to people, learn how to be open, learn how to be networking. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's basically a simple, a simplified version of um, what Tabi was saying. Don't be arrogant, uh, you know, sit down with people, learn to talk to people, learn to be able to be innovative enough to know when to say, what to say, how to say it. Right. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to add something before we conclude the session? Because we are out of time now. So it's about time we wrap up. <laughs> anyone? Oh, oh, there's, wow, wow, how did I miss this? So let's take the last question from Anthony Smart. He asks, what if I've joined an organization and I find a very stubborn boss who really likes things on the old way? How do you propose simpler and innovative ways to have solutions without looking arrogant? Abby, do you want to take that question? Um, I'm trying to read it because I couldn't hear you very clearly. What if I joined an organization and I met a boss, I meet a boss very stubborn and uh, they like things done in the, in the old way, yeah? Old fashioned. Yeah. How do yeah. you propose uh, simpler and innovative ways to offer solutions without being arrogant, yeah? So this goes to um, the soft skills that Rodrigo was talking about. You know, right. how do you how do you front um, your, 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 your idea about wanting to actually change? What is the language you use? Yeah? In, in yeah. Safari, we, we have a culture, and that culture, part of it is, 
uh, critical is an element of language. So how do you say what you want to say so that you, you, ca you come across uh, positively and not negatively, yeah? So don't yes. go to that boss and say, you know, you're old fashioned and, 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 and I have a new way of doing things that is more effective, yeah? yeah. Why don't you just make a suggestion and say, um, how about um, doing this thing like this? Do we want to try and see whether we will get, you know, uh, better results or, you know, um, if that doesn't work, then use a sponsor. A sponsor is yeah. someone who is very close to your boss and can actually pass on the message. If you're very terrified at approaching uh, that boss, there's always a way. And I find that language, uh, you know, uh, breaks barriers. Look for a time when the boss is relaxed and say, you know, I was just thinking about, um, you know, uh, doing this report and adding this one column and removing this. What do you think? You know, make, make him actually come out like he's the one who is actually making the change. And yeah, bosses okay. like to, to be made to feel they're the ones who are actually uh, uh, implement, you know, introducing that change. Yeah. yeah so yeah. look for ways to just go around it. Yeah. And that is why we say the soft skills are very, very important because they will enable you achieve what you want to achieve in an organization. Right. So equip yourself with soft skills, guys. It's going to work to your advantage always. So, uh, you know, um, I think I've learned a lot of this and I speak for very many people. Um, it's safe to conclude now. Thank you so much for joining us, Tabby. Thank you, Chris. You two are very, you were very informative. You're clearly very knowledgeable in your field of work. So we all appreciate that. This session was brought to you by J. Rodriguez Entertainment, which is a collective that seeks to mentor young talent and connect them to industry professionals. So you can like, or you can follow, check out our YouTube channel, you can subscribe. If you missed a part of this session, we're going to put in the recording on YouTube and then you could only check out some other type. So thank you for organizing this and I'd like to wish you a good night. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You much. Stay thank safe. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Tabi. Karibu. Two more of these. I hope we get to have another one of these sometime in the future, All right? Thank you so much for having us, Ella. <laughs> thank sure you. Enough. Have a good thank night, much. guys. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.